Thank you guys so much. So this morning, we get to continue in the book of Romans, with Romans chapter 8. We started chapter 8 last week. Uh, Travis Cook uh, took care of the first part and the third part of chapter 8. And so now this week, I'm going to take care of the second part and the fourth part, if, if you follow all of that. So we're looking at the question today that every parent fears when it comes to vacation time. It's those four words that you always seem to hear, barely as you've even pulled out of the driveway or barely as you've pulled out of the the vacation spot heading home. Are we there yet? Right? You hear it so much from your kids. Are we there yet? I'm sure my parents were driven nuts by the fact that me and my sister used to want to know how much longer. Are we there yet? You know, we didn't have the advantage of Google Maps, right? Now, I just set that in on the dashboard, and, the, and Corbin can look and see how many minutes we have. And sometimes he likes to count it down, and that's just f- so fun, right? <laughs> to hear him count down 20 minutes, 19 minutes, 18, no, okay, we, we got it. You can count backwards, fantastic, right? But as I was growing up, we didn't have that advantage. So my parents were wise, and they knew that I was a kid who loved numbers and loved math, And so they just simply handed me the map. For those of you who don't know what that is, um, just kidding. (laughs) So I would take the map, and I would sit there and go, okay. And it was usually whenever, usually the the longest road trip we would take would be um, going out to Glorietta, New Mexico, to hang out out there, because we are true Baptists, right? That's where we go for vacation, um, it was Glorietta, for Sunday school week and all those things. And so driving back, I wanted to know, how, how long is it? You know, from Amarillo to Kaufman, Texas, how much longer do we have? It was hours, right? So they would just simply hand me a map and say, there you go, you can follow along as we go town by town. And I'm a numbers guy. I like, to, I like to crunch numbers in my head. I'm weird like that. I'm just, I tend to always be crunching numbers. Like, for, for some of you, you're not aware of this, but, okay, let's be honest. Most of you are not aware of this. But in plights, if you were to walk up the stairs in plights to go to the second floor and then to the third floor, you'd walk up 11 steps, 11 steps, 10 steps, 14 steps. Did, anyone else? Anyone else count that? Thank you. All right, good. I'm not weird. Or we're, okay, we're weird. So I'm a numbers guy. I love crunching numbers. And I'm just always doing numbers in my head. And so I take the map. And I would sit there and go, okay, 22 miles from here to here. Okay, 33 miles from here to here. Okay, eight miles between these two towns. And I would just, I'd start adding it up. Okay, well, we're going 60 miles an hour. <laughs> just kidding. Uh, we were going 70, 75 especially if I was asking questions and we start going 80. It was really weird. Um, and so I'd start figuring up, okay, so based on how fast we're going, we'll probably make three stops because I have the world's smallest bladder. Um, okay, kind of figuring another stop or two for my sister. Okay, so I think we're going to get home at this time. And I would say, all right, here's the time. I've got it. We're going to get home at this time. And usually I was within about five to ten minutes of it. It was... It was kind of cool. So I don't know if they would like slow down on the way in to kind of, you know, you know, it's like, there you go, you got it. Or if they would speed up to kind of make the time right or whatever. I don't know. Maybe I was right on. I was always focused on the destination. When I get in the car, I'm focused on the destination. So much so that nowadays with Google Maps, I want to know what's the quickest way to get there, right? I know exactly how to, how to get here to the church, but almost Every morning, I will punch it in to see, okay, where's the traffic? What's the quickest route? You know, I want to get there, and I'm focused on the destination. Today, we're going to try to focus on the destination. And Paul does a great job in Romans chapter 8 of saying, there is a lot of suffering that happens in this world. But in spite of the suffering, during the suffering, through the suffering, we're supposed to focus on the destination. Our goal is heaven. That is what we are focused on. And so for me, Romans chapter 8 is the greatest chapter in the Bible. I, I love it. 
I absolutely love this chapter, and so I'm excited to be up here talking about Romans 8 and, and bringing a word to you this morning. And so I was looking it up, and there's actually a couple of articles out there about why it's the greatest chapter. So I was like, fantastic. If it's on the internet, it's true. So here's what, here's what someone has so eloquently written. They put it into words that I couldn't think of. And so why is it the greatest chapter? There is no chapter that more deeply or fully deals with the brokenness of the physical universe and how it got that way and what will become of it. There is no chapter that expresses with more clarity or power the infallible and unbreakable linkages in our salvation from predestination to glorification. There is no other chapter that combines the intercession of the Holy Spirit in us with the intercession of the Son for us in the service of the never-failing love of God, the Father, over us. There is no chapter that more explicitly or repeatedly juxtaposes the necessary horrors of our suffering with the utterly assured grandeur of our glory that moves with such force through suffering to a crescendo of unshakable hope in the love of God. There is no chapter that deals more directly and tenderly with our struggle to know that we are the children of God, opening to us the witness of the Holy Spirit. There is no chapter with with a more sustained litany of privileges, securities, and assurances to hold us firmly in the keeping love of God. And last, there is no chapter in which so many glorious truths are marshaled to help us obey only one implied command. Live by the Spirit, not the flesh, and so fulfill the whole law that is love. It's a great chapter, and to me, it's the greatest chapter. And you might have another chapter you want to put up against it, and let's go. I'll, I'll fight you on it. Let's do it. But um, later, not now. This would be awkward. So we're going to look at Romans chapter 8 together. So we're going to start in verse 18, if you wouldn't mind turning there. If you want to kind of see this, how this pieces together, and you missed last week, you can go uh, to the podcast and check out what uh, Travis uh, said last week. And so he covered the first 17 verses, and so we're going to be picking up in Romans 8, 18. And so we're going to do Romans 8, 18 through 25, and then we'll jump ahead to 31 through 39. And kind of the way I want to do it this morning is I just want to walk through this. We're going to read it together once, and then I'm just going to walk through verse by verse because it's, it's so powerful and there's so much meat here. And so I want us to look at our suffering and how it lines up with God's love. Verse 18 says this, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the, for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Verse 31, what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who is indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. 
For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. I mean, we can just go home now. (laughs) Amen? In this life, we have suffering. But this morning, I want to look at how that suffering lines up with the love of God. So let's let's look at verse 18. The first thing I want us to see is this. Our suffering has an expiration date. Our suffering has an expiration date. Verse 18, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Paul says, Paul says this, if you put the two on a scale, the glory that is to be revealed far outweighs our present, suf- our present sufferings. Paul would say our present sufferings is almost like it's, it's a rock. It's a heavy rock that we bear. And some of you are going through the sufferings that, that others don't know about. Some of you have been sharing those with your connect groups, and they are walking through that with you. Some of you have someone that's close to you that's going through something where they are suffering through something right now. And you are walking through them with that. And it's a heavy burden. The suffering's not light. That's not what Paul says. Paul's not saying that the suffering is light. Paul's saying that the suffering, it pales in comparison to the glory that is to come. This rock is basically sitting next to a boulder. The rock is heavy. It's a burden. But Paul says that our glory that is to be revealed far outweighs our present sufferings. Why? Well, the people that Paul is writing to, they are followers of Jesus. They have made a decision to follow Jesus. They have given their lives to him. They have placed their faith and their trust in the fact that Jesus died and rose again for them. We call them Christians, little Christs. It was actually an insult, but they liked it. So they said, okay, yeah, call us that. Little Christs, sweet. That's actually what they said. They said sweet. I know you didn't know that. (laughs) Paul says, if you are a follower of Jesus, you are also his child. Now he talks about this in verse 16 and 17 from last week. We are adopted into his family. We are loved by God. Because of God's love, that is the boulder, right? That is the boulder that we can compare it to. Yes, the suffering is real, but it pales in comparison to God's love. Paul says God's love is amazing. Paul is actually applying what he said earlier in verse 5. In verse 5, he says this, For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. Paul is saying, I'm I'm going to keep my mind focused where it should be. Yes, the suffering is real. Paul talks about his own sufferings that he deals with, his own thorn in the flesh. But then he says, compare it to Jesus? Compare it to my adoption as son? It doesn't compare. It far outweighs it. Our suffering has an expiration date. But secondly, our suffering is because of sin. Verse 19 through 21 says this, For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it. Our suffering is because of sin. And let me be clear, I'm not talking about a personal sin that you've done has caused you to suffer. That's not what I'm saying. That was actually, that was a belief back in that day for for many people. But Jesus says in John 9, when he's getting ready to heal a man who was born blind, his disciples asked him, right? They said, was it his sin or his parents' sin that caused him to be born blind? And Jesus said, neither. It's so that God can receive glory. So you're suffering that you're going through, that your friend might be going through, a family member is going through. I'm not saying it's because of their sin. I'm saying it's because we live in a broken and fallen world. Once sin entered into the world in Genesis, in the garden, with Adam and Eve, 
our world has been broken ever since. So much so that I love the description that Paul uses that it's, it's longing to be restored. It's longing for the day when a new heaven and new earth come down. And it's longing to be restored. Our suffering is because of sin. It's one of the reasons that God hates sin. Sin is awful because of what it does to our relationship with him, but also what it does to us. The sin that is in this world that creates brokenness and suffering. It's why God hates sin. So our, our suffering has an expiration date. Our suffering is because of sin. But also, Paul says our suffering is worth it. Verse 22 and 23 For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our our bodies. Our suffering is worth it. I love that Paul uses the example of childbirth, right? Well, I, I probably shouldn't say I love it. I, ladies, let me take that back. I, I don't love it. Let me just be clear on that. But Paul uses this example of childbirth. Why? Because it's, brain, it's, it's pain that brings life. I love that he uses that analogy. It's pain that brings life into the world. I think about that. I think about when, when Corbin was born. Nicole and I, we walk into the hospital room at 7 p.m. on Tuesday, October 18th, 2011. It was a great day. That's not Corbin's birthday. That's bad, right? It was a 22-hour delivery process. It wasn't until 5 p.m. on the 19th that he was finally born. It was a long process, but Nicole would tell you it was worth it. He's worth it, right? Not many people would say, yeah, let me go through that right now. That sounds awesome, right? But the child that comes through that process, that child is worth it. It's, it's, it's your son, it's your daughter. Maybe it's, you know, it, it's worth it. It's the pain that's worth it. Now think about our, our next few years of life after that. Two years later, we get pregnant again. We, we? No, no. Oh, okay, never mind. Two years later, we're pregnant again. And we're like, okay, all right. Brother, sister, what's it going to be? And then we have to walk through a miscarriage. 11 weeks in. We actually celebrated that date this past week, July 17. It's a day that will always be in our minds. It's the day that, that we, we lost our baby. And little, little do we know that was the last chance we were going to have to be pregnant. Now we have this thing called secondary infertility. It's a thing you don't know about until you have to walk through it. And some people would tell us, well, at least you have one. And, and you know, they're trying to be helpful when they say that, but it, 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 doesn't, it doesn't take away the pain. It doesn't take away the suffering. And so we really wrestled with God... Why? We, we want Corbin to have a brother or a sister. Why are you not allowing us to, to have that? Why are you not allowing us to experience that? Why are we having to go through this suffering? We really wrestled with the Lord on it. And ultimately, what God led us to was foster care. We realized that there was a way for Corbin to have brothers and sisters. And so we started looking at adoption and started looking at that, and we quickly stopped looking at that once we realized how much it cost to adopt. So they're going, hmm, minister, stay-at-home mom. No, no, let's see what else there is. And then Nicole went to a seminar about adoption or about foster care. And so we really started praying through, okay, God, is, is this something that you want us to do? All of a sudden, we saw the need. We saw the, the hurt. We saw the numbers. We saw the, that, that there was a great need for families to step up and be a part of foster care. 
And so, as we've kind of said in, in, our, in our relationship with my, my, me and Nicole in foster care, she's the gas, I'm the brakes, right? <laughs> and so she was about six to nine months ahead of me uh, in this process and was ready, but was just patiently waiting for me. And there's one day that I'm reading in Galatians where Paul is talking about this adoption as sons, being adopted into God's family. And all of a sudden I realized Foster care is a picture of the gospel. It's it's the gospel in action. Why would I not do that? And so we said yes. We said yes to foster care. And ultimately, because of that decision, we have Levi, our three-year-old. I'm sitting there going, we almost missed out on Levi. I mean, it's weird to think of him as not in my family. I mean, that's my son. There was a lot of suffering that we went through. And it's, there are still times where we, we see someone post and they're having their eighth child or whatever it is. You know, we're sitting there going, okay, that's kind of hard to read sometimes. You know, there's still those moments where it's painful. But the suffering was worth it. Levi was worth it. We didn't know it at the time. But it was worth it. It's pain that brings life. That's how Paul describes it. It's pain that brings life. So our suffering has an expiration date. Our suffering is because of sin. Our suffering is worth it. And then also, Paul says our suffering points us to Christ's return. Verse 24 and 25. And it says this, For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Our hope is wrapped up in faith and patience. Patience is hard. I've jokingly said I've stopped praying for God to give me patience, right? We don't like having to go through patience. It's hard. I didn't want to be patient during those years of miscarriage and infertility, But now on the other side, I'm so glad that we were patient. I'm so glad that we continued to call out to the Lord and to to trust him and to take those steps with him. It was worth it. Our hope is wrapped up in faith and in patience. But then next, our suffering makes us more like Jesus. This is where we're going to jump down to verse 31, to to the crescendo of the passage, I would say. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. You see, Paul outlines why we have hope. He goes back to verse 24 and 25 and says, you want to know why you can have hope, why you can have patience? It's because God offers us forgiveness, right? Verse 32, his forgiveness is why he is for us. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. He offered us a way out of our sin. He offered us a way out He offered us forgiveness. And then God wraps his loving arms around us. He outlines why we have our hope. It's Jesus interceding for us. Go back to verse one, right? There's there's, There's therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. This verse makes me think about high school for me. You see, in high school... I wasn't quite the stud athlete that you see up here today, all right? Let's, I'll just be really honest with you. Um, but in spite of me being too short to go out for football and get you know, ripped from Linda Lim or not quick enough to play basketball or not really knowing what to do with a soccer ball other than you kick it towards a goal, um, I went out and I played tennis. And I got, I got good at tennis, and I was in, uh, our, I was on our high school tennis team, and um, 
I was on the JV team for about three years and won a couple of tournaments. I was good. I wasn't great, right? I was, I was good. The reason I never made it to varsity, the reason I didn't get any college scholarships or colleges even looking at me or even knowing my name or even that I played tennis, is because I played defensively. I was always on the baseline. I was always on the baseline, right? In tennis, you win when you approach the net. You approach the net, you go to the net, right? But I, I didn't want to do that. I just always stayed on the baseline. I didn't want to aim for the, for, for the, for the lines because I was afraid I was going to hit it out. So I would stay on the baseline and I would hit it back deep middle. Not really going to win many games that way, just, just being honest. There's not many matches you're going to win that way. I played defensively. Paul is saying, I'm handing you the keys to the playbook. Play offense. Don't play defensively in this life. Go play offense. Had I actually learned how to play offense, approach the net, you know, aim for the lines? Yes. Are there times that I would have hit it out? Yes. Are there times that I would have hit it into the net and messed up? Yes. But how much better would my tennis game have been had I learned how to play offense? Paul is saying, don't play defense. Don't just say, I'm going to try to make it through the day without messing up today. That's not our job. Our job is to go play offense. To say, we have been given the keys to the gospel. God has wrapped his loving arms around us. Jesus is interceding at the right hand of God for us. The Holy Spirit is living in us. So now we're going to go and we're going to play offense. And we're going to take the gospel anywhere we can, wherever we can. And we're going to have those conversations. Are we going to get shut down from time to time? You bet. You know what? Our suffering makes us look more like Jesus. And it's worth it. God says, play offense. Take the gospel wherever you can. Love anyone that you can. Share with them what it looks like to be a follower of Jesus. And don't hold back. Don't play defense. Play offense. What would it look like in your life if you were just to let it loose and play offense this week for the gospel? What would it look like in your life this week? What conversations would be different? What things would you do? What places would you go? My challenge for you this week, play offense. Don't play defensively. Don't just try to get by without committing a sin. But let's move the gospel forward. Let's love fiercely. Let's show grace and talk about truth at the same time. Let's play offense. In verse 35 and 36, last thing, our suffering points us to God's love for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. Paul goes back to our sufferings. Right? Paul shows us that our suffering and God's love for us are intertwined. Our suffering and God's love for us are intertwined. And as I read this, I think about the story of Horatio Spafford. Maybe you know his story, but if you don't, it's a story you need to know. Horatio Spafford was born in 1828. He was a successful lawyer in Chicago. He was also a committed Christian man who supported the ministry of the well-renowned preacher Dwight L. Moody. But he was also a man faced with a series of tragedies. You see, he had heavily invested in the Chicago real estate. And the great fire of Chicago in October 1871 wiped him out financially. He went bankrupt. And so for the next two years, he started building his life back financially. 
So then finally, in 1873, they were in a good place again, and they finally wanted to go and, they, and spend some time together and celebrate him and his family. So in 1873, he and his family were planning a trip to visit Europe. He was delayed by business matters, but he sent his wife, Anna, and their four daughters ahead on the ocean liner. Mid-ocean, their ship was struck by an English ship. The ocean liner quickly sank, resulting in the deaths of 226 people, among them Spafford's four daughters. Spafford's wife, Anna, survived the wreck and sent a telegram to Horatio saying, Saved alone, what shall I do? So Spafford boarded a ship to join his wife in England where the rescue vessel had taken her. He asked the captain of the ship to point out the location of the wreck that had taken the lives of his daughters. And when they came to that place on the waters, he stood and he reflected on the terrible thing that had happened to his family. Then he walked back to his room And he penned these words. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, Whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul, it is well. With my soul, it is well, it is well with my soul. That's what he wrote. In the midst of pain, in the midst of suffering, He goes straight back to the Lord. I I don't know that I could have done that. I hope I would have. But I don't know that I could have done that. Listen to some of the other lyrics he wrote that night. Though Satan should buffet, those trials should come. Let this blessed assurance control that Christ has regarded my helpless estate and has shed his own blood for my soul. My sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought, my sin not in part, but the whole, is nailed to the cross and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, oh, my soul. And Lord, haste the day when my faith shall be sight. The clouds be rolled back as a scroll. The trump shall resound and the Lord shall descend. Even so, it is well with my soul. In the midst of suffering, he preaches the gospel to himself. In the midst of suffering, he reminds himself who he is, that he is saved by Jesus. He's a child of God. It's at the core of who he is. So when he's in the midst of his suffering, that's what he runs back to, his identity. His identity isn't that he's a father or a husband. His identity is that he is a son of God because he's been adopted into God's family. And I can't help but wonder, did he go to Romans 8 in his mind? Did he read Romans 8 in his room at any point during that trip? because it sounds so much like it. I close with verse 37 through 39. Again, our suffering points us to God's love for us. 
So Paul finishes this chapter this way. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. God loves you. God loves you. And in the midst of suffering, Paul says, don't forget the core truth of who you are. If you are a follower of Jesus, you are his child, you are in his family, and God loves you, there's nothing that will separate you from God. There's nothing you can go through that removes God's hand from your life. God is holding on to you. You're not holding on to him. He's holding on to you, and he will not let go. Today, remember, nothing will separate us from the love of God because we win. Romans 8, we win. When you think about the end times, when you think about the last days, we win. I'm going to invite the the band to come back up because we're going to close singing that song that we sang right right before I came up. It is well with my soul. And so today I want to ask you, what suffering are you going through? And are you allowing that suffering to point you back to Jesus? Because Romans 8 says that God wants to wrap his arms around you. He wants to walk you through that suffering. I look back at at our miscarriage and the pain that that I went through. And I, I wouldn't trade it back in. It helped me to understand God's love for me more. It drew me closer to him. But also, it helped me to grow as a person, as a, as a husband, as a father. God grew me in that moment. My relationship with God is stronger today because of what I went through. And God says he wants your relationship with him to be stronger today, even in spite of what you're going through, because of what you're going through. When we don't have suffering, so many times, maybe you're like me, it's so easy to say, God, I've got this. I'm in control. I can handle it. I'm good. Life's good. We don't really feel the need. But God would say, no, you need me. You need me. You must be dependent on me. And there are times that I believe he he allows us to experience suffering because it returns us to him and it can help build and restore and strengthen our relationship with him. God's looking at the big picture. He wins. He knows. But also he's saying, I want you to be as close to me as I can get you. I want my relationship with you to be as deep as it can be. And if allowing you to go through that pain and through that heartache and through that suffering creates that moment for you where you come back to me, then yes, I will allow you to go through that. God wants you to draw near to him. He wants to remind you how great his love is for you today. So my question is, will you let him? Will you trust him with what you're going through? Will you lean into him? Will you go to him? Will you pray to him? Will you go to others around you and allow them to walk through it with you? It's so easy to have the game face of, yeah, I'm good. Life's great. But that's not what living a Christian life is about. It's about having people around you say, life is hard. I need help. I'm suffering. I'm hurting. And I need people around me to walk through this with me. And now is not the time to shut down God, to shut him out. Now is the time to say, God, I need you now more than ever. 
So let's stand and let's sing to our great God who loves us unconditionally. Thank you for taking time to watch this sermon. If you would like more information about our church or following Jesus, please go to our website, pcbc.org, or contact our church offices. We hope to see you next week at church.